Oh wait, that's loud. <laughs> okay. Let's see if we can regulate this a bit. There you go. <coughs> so. All right. Is that better? Still loud, isn't it? So, welcome, all five people. So, thanks for joining. Yeah, question, please. Oh, okay. I take that uh, as a uh, note. That's a good point. Uh, yeah, we need to deal with that. So let me just note that down. I delegate that to Simon because he's generally dealing with those things. Let's see. Cool. Mm -hmm. So good. Okay. Um, so today you're dealing with me. Um, I know, but probably you wouldn't even need to use the microphone. Can you survive the volume, or is it too way too loud? It's not loud. Okay, that's a weird uh, reflection here. Anyway, um, but I'm using it so we have a meaningful recording of this uh, session here. Um, cool. Right. So today I'm um, placing in um, or, or filling in. The, the originally, the idea was that um, uh, an external speaker is talking about characters and world development. So it was the uh, intuition. But um, she won't make it um, this week. So uh, I'm, I'm giving a talk on um, spaces and yeah, elements of aesthetics. Um, instead, so next week that will be the uh, scheduled talk um, for for that week. So Simon and uh, Simon is away f um, this week, so um, that's another reason why he's not uh, here and talking about this particular topic. So we're talking about spaces and uh, aesthetics. Um, cool. So the 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 um, idea of space and aesthetics have we have we covered that somewhere else already in experience design or do you guys have any background uh, with this as part of game design? Because I realize when talking to groups on Fridays that oftentimes people have considerable experience with many of the topics we talk about even prior to, you know, coming here and um, uh, learning and working with experience design. Yeah, well, I saw a nodding, a sensation. No, okay. So right. So um, this so this this session is pretty much all about uh, modeling space um, in, in in your game, right? And thinking about how you develop the world and so on. I believe um, Simon may have talked about transmedia worlds to some extent. Did he? Did you hear that term before? Transmedia worlds. So it's really about looking at the application from a. Um, or for the game rather, looking at the game as a you know. Um, from a holistic perspective, including a, an ecosystem that consists both of the actual game, the story, the world you're engaging in, but also carrying narratives, um, so stories, um, again, a topic of a future session, um, that exist within the game and beyond. So, for example, you find that a particular um, w venues such as um, Star Wars and the like have spawned off very successful, you know, Transmedia worlds, which is basically uh, have branched off into um, merchandise in particular, right? So game, action figures, and so on. And we should remember that Star Wars, wh when was Star Wars released? Does anyone know or recall? Or Not that anyone was born here in this room, including me, no? Yeah, uh, I think 77, uh, but, but again, uh, I, I read it myself, so I was uh, not uh, thorough. But uh, yeah, so 77, so it's fairly dated, right? Put it this way. So it's 40 years old or ish. Um, so it's probably, um, yeah, surprising that it's still around, right? So, but part of it, the reason was the um, development, the parallel development of a um, whole world that people could immerse in as children at that time or juveniles at that time um, and actually, you know, um, participate in the storytelling even beyond the movie. Having a movie of two hours doesn't really cut it. Nowadays, we think about it in those terms, but if you have this long-running uh, um, series of, um, of, of uh, movies such Lord of the Rings, uh, Star Wars, but also a Disney series going, 
then you become fairly independent of uh, those particular individual worlds that you have been creating. So this is obviously going beyond what we are looking about today, but it's something you wouldn't want to consider when you think about a holistic development of a game, including the experience that surrounds it. Um, but today it's um, reasonably much more concrete. By the way, this talk will, or my part of it, will only last till roughly 2.30, I believe. Uh, originally there was uh, a planned session for the application track, but I believe it hasn't been scheduled as far as I gather, so it may or may not happen. Furthermore, um, perhaps we are lucky and we get a um, um, some indication. Simon said if they are, have an opportunity, they would stream something from the um, Game Summit in, um, in Madrid, where they are right now, or Lisbon, I think, where they are right now. So, uh, but we'll see how that happens or if that happens in the first place. So this is just the initial start of it here. So, um, so the idea is really that um, if we look at um, spaces, what is the functional space? Um, that is really the, what was the functional space, does anyone recall? Anyone? No? What could it be? It should have been covered in some lectures. Yeah, please. Yes, right? So the actual area you can act in, right? So there's this functional space. My practical functional space, yeah, possibly extends to the back there. But realistically, it's probably, if you want to gamify my situation, you probably would possibly end up here with my you know, range of movement. But there's a lot more space outside that that may actually, for example, the virtual space over there, the camera looking at me, that is not something I can directly, in inter well, I could interact with it, but I cannot act in that very space, right? So I'm constrained to the functional environment I'm in right now. Um, and that uh, involves, obviously, the action space that I have, the possible actions I can perform, um, and uh, the boundaries, uh, necessarily, and uh, the magic circle in, uh, of the interaction that we can have. So, <coughs> so it does suggest that even though um, you, have, you talk about spaces and possibly even worlds, you need to be really clear what uh, kind of space you're referring to. So, and we concentrate on this for this iteration, whereas, for example, the transmedia worlds spawning off into uh, the, the worship world or the, the uh, narrative world, thoughts um, or stories and so on, is beyond what, we're, what the scope is in this iteration. We're really looking at the functional space uh, right now as a more essential um, bit of game development. So which fundamental forms of functional spaces do you guys know from games? Yeah, discrete function spaces, okay, yep. Ah, okay, right, right. So you're thinking from a development point of view, right? So as soon as some object, for example, item is located in a particular grid sector, then it's occupying this entire grid sector, or it's not, so kind of a binary. Uh, um, allocation problem there, right? So, what's the what's the opposite of that? What's uh, discrete always comes with? What's the opposite of discrete? Continuous, right? So you have a continuous positioning option. Realistically, uh, how continuous that really is is the question, right? So it always needs to be somewhat cr uh, discretized uh, in in the uh, in the game world to make it computable, because you guys probably know that floats are not the friend of every uh, of computing in general. So, yep. What other what other concepts of spaces do you guys know? You can also refer to examples, and we can see, figure out if we um, identify the spaces there. Yeah, please. Football, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if you if you bring it down to a, a computational game, what would be examples there? Yeah, think about um, games that actually um, um, the kind of well historically, what kind of what, what kind of worlds or spaces did we usually interact with in in games? Do you remember that, or can you? So when we let's say the you know jump and runs, for example, right? So what kind of spaces do we deal with there? Yeah, but think about the uh, dimensionality of the game. 
right, we have x and y, right, so, and cool. So what would that be in terms of dimensionality? Right, so um, functionally, or uh, from, a, from a conceptual point of view, it's 2D, right? So you can do a few actions. One of the actions probably jump, right? Surprise, surprise, and the other one is run, right? And they are basically associated with those uh, two dimensions, x and y. But looking at for, from a world perspective, um, like from a storyline perspective, how many dimensions do we actually deal with? So many, how many movement directions do we actually have in a jump and run? Can you generally move upwards other than jumping? So we generally are constrained by our movements to what directions? Left or right, right? So we have a um, left or right movement that defines the storyline fundamentally. Even though, yes, we can actually use the y-axis for jumping, for example, right? So, um, but we are kind of constrained by, uh, um, by, by that. So that's uh, the classic concept of side-scrolling games. If we talk about spaces, that are um, truly functional, and we call them 2D, 2D spaces, we mean that we actually can have controlled movers, branches, uh, or, or decision making uh, along the, um, in that space that allows us to move into a different direction. It would be like a um, jump and run game where you, you know, can branch off into a different reality and continue there. Yeah? So you start scrolling game. So that's why we actually refer to them as a 1D um, space uh, by, by um, from a storyline point of view, right? So we have effectively one, one form of movement which can be unidirectional, so in one direction, usually it's uh, left to right, right, in jump and runs, but it can also be the opposite. Um, an offline game that has this characteristic is obviously Monopoly, right? So we have a circular movement, but it's fundamentally one directional because um, it always, you know, um, follows the very same, same pattern. The key thing here, dim dimensionality is defined by uh, the ability to select branches you know, or pass selection, which we don't have, right? So it's the uh, limitation we have. So uh, 2D games would ben then be games that actually allow you to move um, in uh, multiple directions. So classically, classical games to do that would be, what would be a good game? As an example. Anyone? Yep. Yes, exactly. Simulation is one of the yeah uh, spot on ones. Yes. So that's considerable two uh, D game, right? So even though there may be you know some uh, whatever Z movements, but they are only they they don't have any impact on the story. They don't um, define any new branches of. Even if you by theory have a third dimension for 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 your buildings, that's right. So civilization. Uh, SimCity and the like, right? So I think technically SimCity is actually often called a 2.5D system because you actually have some notion of obscurity because they have it angled as a as a 40, um, what is it, like a 45 degree angle when you look at it, right? So, and y there's some simple mechanisms of obscuring items behind, you know, buildings and so on. So um, th that's, that's kind of an approximation of somewhat 3D-ish experience, but it's fundamentally a 2D game. Yeah, consider this well. And there are different grids um, forms that are available. So generally, it's a four-way uh, standard grid. But you can also have alternative forms, such a six-way uh, um, or like the hexa hexa hexagonal uh, grid uh, form. This would be an alternative way of dealing with this, um, or other advanced uh, shades or patterns. Um, so, yeah, obviously this has impact on your pos potential gameplay, right, depending on the orientation of the map, but um, also from the logical point of view, because um, depending on how you model it, you could model um, it as a toro uh, torus, basically, where you have a whole, basically a sphere you can move around. It would imply that if you, for example, hang on, let me get my mouse here somewhere. If you move from the lower right to the lower left, you would end up the ro lower right first, uh, lower right again, right? So it's not a flat uh, um, game with hard boundaries, but it would actually allow you to traverse the entire sphere if you wanted to. Uh, in the same way, it would allow you to do the same thing on a uh, this horizontal layer, right? Um, so it's obviously different forms. It could also be a cylindrical um, game world where it allows you basically to um, yeah, loop around basically the, the space, but actually does not allow you to traverse um, towards the y-axis. Yeah. So, yep, please, I'm easy. Yeah. Okay.
Ja. Hmm. Right. Cool. So that's a good explanation. Yeah. So it's so well captured there. Um, cool. But coming back to the world boundaries, right? How you design the game? Those are all decisions that you actually need to make. Is your world closed? How do you move between different worlds? For example, you could have a uh, if you use this this square spacing that could define a individual sector of your world, right? So, but you would be able to actually move to a different sector of your world. Notion of teleportation without explicit uh, walking or you know uh, traveling as such, or it could define your entire world. In this case, for example, like in a spherical environment, you would be able to have continuous movement and navigate between different areas. So it's different ways of <coughs> exploiting the benefits of those ones. So, for example, a, a spherical world would constrain you because if you have only one world, it would delimit you know the options you actually have. Whereas if you define it as a sector of your world, you can jump between different ones then you can obviously arbitrarily expand your perceived world, at least from a narrative point of view. Um, <clears throat> so looking at this, um, what is the possible problem with this kind of grid layouts in terms of movement? Does anyone, does anyone can see any logical challenges with using those environments for um, modeling games, when modeling games? So I mentioned before, if you model this in a, um, in a continuous fashion, suggesting that an individual that moves vertically will ultimately end up here at the bottom again and uh, be able to traverse the world again, right? So it would be end-to-end -end connectivity here between those sides, here, here, and also um, of the corners. So, but what's the possible problem that can uh, arise from that? Any ideas? From a mechanical point of view. Well, we know Pythagoras, so, um, and the idea is basically we, we would need to mo uh, move at a higher speed. If you want to assume that the, the world is closed here and it's connected, this, uh, the movement along this uh, diagonal is actually longer than the movement along the uh, horizontal, right? So we actually suddenly need to realize, okay, hang on, if we move through our world in a diagonal, diagonal fashion, we either need to speed up the player Right? So it increase the movement speed, or we realize that a player that moves horizontally will always be faster in traversing the entire world than one that moves diagonally. Right? So it's a conceptual problem with using a square kind of world representation. Can everyone follow? Quite straightforward, right? So um, because you know, per, uh, per Pythagoras, we can basically uh, calculate the hypotenuse. I think it's the English term for that one, and the other one is cathesis. Um, and um, you will find that it's basically the um, squ square of the root of the uh, sum of the squares of those um, two, um, um, uh, two, two distances here, right? So of the horizontal and vertical distances. Since it's similarly longer, longer, but you want to have the same behavior or same chance for the player, for example, to traverse or same time for the player to traverse the entire world, you would need to play increase the player speed as soon as he or she starts moving diagonally. So it's something you need to consider in your framework, in your game men mental framework or game framework. So there's a lot of those problems associated with space, right? So we need to think about, okay, how does it, is it reflected? How does it affect my actual game world if I have those, um, you know, slightly odd-shaped um, um, systems, so. But um, not to get too hung up on this one, there are co completely different forms of spaces we can model here as well. Um, so obviously it could be, it really depends on the emphasis of your game. Right now, we were looking at more like civilization or strategy style games, right? Where you have a fixed environment, you move. But perhaps, depending on uh, the nature of your game and its focus on travel, for example, it may be more worthwhile um, to actually model your um, space as a graph, where you just move between points because you have fixed pathways to move amongst them. The classic idea would be an underground map, right? So uh, if you're thinking about this, the action space is of a relative within a given uh, sp um, position is of limited concern, but it's rather the travel that's the challenge, right? Logistics um, games would be in this kind of um, in this kind of um, in this um, problem. Another way would be to model it as 
previously, as I mentioned, like zones, basically. Well, no, divided space would be the, the more accurate description. But having individual points of interest that you could basically visit and you know perform actions there and then teleport to the next uh, location to continue the action there. Does anyone know a game that has this kind of uh, facilities? Well, the focus is on either logistics in its entirety or about traveling between individual points based on teleporting capabilities. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. Cool. Yeah. So, but the actors, so it's basically like a simulation a bit, right? Is it? So you basically create your uh, network and then have actors, you know, enter the system and you see what they do, right? And hopefully it works out and you have a good traffic flow, no congestion and things like that. Right, so okay, right. So, but okay, yeah. you could also imagine um, that the actors actually have more capability in, yeah. But th that's the essence. You're capturing the essence of that uh, idea. What would be an example for a uh, game that plays uses a point map? So where transportation is kind of a given. So you just say, I want to move from A to Z, um, or in a different point in that map uh, allocation. But you actually don't deal with the travel, but rather focus on the individual. Places. What's what's uh, is there any game you have in mind that has this kind of feature? Please. Uh -huh. Yeah. Right. 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 Bah. Oh, cool. Okay. Yes, you're right. There was. Uh, yeah. Mario World. Does does everyone know is acquainted with this one? Mario World. Yes. No. Perhaps. Yeah. Somewhat. Okay. Moderate nodding. Please. Ah. Right. Yes. Cool. Yeah. So that's that would be one way uh, of dealing with this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. But it could also be so you have fast travel between different places that are not connected, right? They're disconnected, right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So you really have this. Uh, 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 um, a connectivity that wouldn't be possible in a physical world, right? You're jumping from one to the other map, basically using this uh, fast travel mechanism, somewhat abstractly. So, okay, cool. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, sure, it depends on the logic of the game. Um, that makes sense. So the other uh, concept that's different from those two ones would be in the divided space, where it's really about sectors uh, in the game that you can move between or shift uh, between, basically, but they can or may, uh, may be connected. doesn't mean that you can easily traverse to them, but they are somewhat co connected. Um, is there any game that comes to mind that has this feature? Ah, World of Warcraft, yes, possibly, yep, cool. What, uh, which other game? Fake one you mentioned before. Civilization has this feature, right? So you can move between different cultures, but they are laterally connected or not, right? Isn't it? So um, this is the kind of different features that you possibly have. So it really depends how you model a game. Is it firstly, you know, real-time game, or can you pause certain worlds and act in others, so shift and travel between those, uh, or what the game is about? If it's a logistics game you're dealing with, uh, you know, where the major action basically plays. And if you have actually a time and money to model the, log the logistics as well, right? Perhaps it's just cheaper to move from a, you know, marketplace. I don't know, for example, in racing games, right? You generally have hardly any representation of physical movement. It's more along the lines of having a menu-based trading system and you, s you know, uh, boost up your car and then you actually race again, right? So there's no physical representation of trading uh, or the actual transport, right, that you're de dealing with. So it's one of the other things. Um, what are important aspects there as well? So we, this is more like big picture. Okay, what type of game do you have? And which kind of space corresponds or interacts well with the kind of game you want to develop? So it really boils down to what kind of uh, game you develop. But what's, what's important when you design an extra space in a game? What are possibly important features or elements? Please. The purpose of the space? Yeah, okay, yeah. Can you come up with an example, perhaps, or an idea? <coughs> um, no, uh, I, I didn't get it right now. Skin. Okay. Yep. Okay. So, boiling down to the purpose of the uh, 
space in that particular game. So I suggest that it depends, for example, on a racetrack versus trading area or something like that. Is that the intuition you have? Right, okay. So, yeah, other thoughts? Exactly, yep, cool, that's, that's a good part of it, yep. So, yep, that's one aspect. Other thoughts? So topology or the, yeah, space should fit the game, obviously, yep. Again, yep. Yep, cool. Yep. Yep, exactly. But it's also, on the other hand, shouldn't be too small, right? So if you have, for example, want to, model a universe, right, or multiple worlds, or whatever you want to call it, then uh, having, making it too small is obviously a concern as well. In fact, um, I'll, um, I'll leave you with a link to an amazing game review that has, uh, does that, it reviews those. I probably post it on Blackboard um, that, that precisely looks at the co concern and has uh, it's actually a review of a space game and just criticizing the fact that it's so incredibly small, uh, which seems to be quite unfitting. It's actually quite an amazing review, but it's so, so many uh, questionable. Yeah, the, the, the language is quite questionable, so I'm not sure if I can stream that here. So, um, so I leave you with the link instead. It's probably more, 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 more responsible on my part here. But looking again, um, when you're modeling space, uh, for example, in the third year, the students and you, you talk to them to some extent. They actually modeling games. For example, they are uh, reinventing the idea of jump and runs, which is uh, quite amazing. Uh, quite nice solutions they actually come up with. But if you think, for for example, you're modeling a scenario, right? So it could be in a two-dimensional world or a jump and run kind of, you know, single dimensional uh, flow of story. Um, well, probably more two dimensional. What's important uh, there when you model the world? Particular, or put it this way, you are a third person player in a, uh, in, in a three dimensional um, space. What's an important aspect you need to consider when you design that world or that space? Yeah? Yeah, Ali. So, can you say what, what do you mean with alienating? Cool. Yep. It's a very important point. So, consistency is that a term that would summarize. So, it needs to fit the theme of your game, right? So, you don't want to have a space game that has a scenario that would be probably more rela related to South Pacific Island. So, you kind of want to have it consistent with your game, but also that the different levels or worlds or whatever else are have some sort of consistency amongst, you know, with each other, right? So, cool. What's another aspect? If you think about larger worlds, what's quite important? <coughs> yeah? Yeah, cool. How do you deal with the transition, right? So, uh, yep, that's, that's quite important. So, if you think about NTNU as your small world that you will inhabit for the future, some of you anyway, um, what's, how do you navigate? over the campus. Yep. So, but navigate in a sense of planning. For example, if I'm asking you to uh, go over to the A building, for example, so how do you, you know, how do you navigate back to the A building, for example? So, what are you using? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's the kind of the global orientation, right? So we the God's eye view kind of thing of navigation amongst the, uh, within a given game, right? So yeah, so yeah, we get that's right. Yeah. Memory. So uh, w what did you memorize? Yeah. Exactly, right, so, exactly. So what you have two things in there, so you remember where the A building is, that seems to be, and that's your starting point possibly of navigation, right, because you're largely based there, I guess. So first of all, you have a point of reference that you probably internalized, and then you use the term relative. 
because it's not an absolute point of reference, it's relative to other buildings, right? So we have, nobody of us knows our exact GPS position, we are probably not really interested in all either, right? But the relative position to your place of living, to the A building, you know, or um, something that we relate to, makes sense, right? And you, you have the uh, idea really of uh, landmarks, I guess, right? So you have a conceptual uh, viewpoint of, of, of landmarks. For example, uh, when, when I'm looking out of the um, little atrium in uh, NTNU in A building, big A, I kind of have this focal point that I'm looking across and trying to fi figure out where the uh, she blotner, um, um, you know, where the, where the area is, the, um, the wharf basically is. So it gives me a good orientation of where I am right now. So you have those little specific, often human-made landmarks, but not necessarily um, that will actually define your navigation. So, and the, the point I want to get at here is from a individualized navigation, this is God's eye navigation, and here is more like, you know, micro level navigation, right? Because you don't have a God's eye view on the campus, right? In fact, you probably wouldn't even really relate to it because sometimes you look at your own city from God's eye perspective, map perspective, it doesn't really feel the way, the same way you think about it, right? So, yep. Right, right. Cool. Yep. Right, that's, a, that's another way, yes. That's uh, controlled signage, you will always be fine. Yep, that, that's one way. But landmarks works, works probably in more smaller spaces where you don't have the luxury of those uh, uh, signage. But I can give, give you a good example. If you're navigating, I mean, it probably applies pretty much in every big country, but in, in, in New Zealand, um, you want to get from a bigger city A to bigger city B, they will never get lost because there's always a signage pointing you to those bigger cities. However, if you want to end up in those smaller towns in uh, between, that's usually quite hard to find, or relatively hard to find. So signage, they are quite explicit <coughs> as a way of, um, of, of navig navigating. But what, what I really wanted to get at is really some sort of landmark. So you need to have elements in your game, in your map that stick out and are reasonably unique, right? So you can't just... Be con maybe we have a convenient setup where you have a subsection of a map, right, including larger buildings, uh, theater, swimming pool, and you know school, and you know th if you're thinking SimCity right now, basically replicate this entire area and pasting that like five times and so on, right? If you do that, your player gets horribly lost, right? That's not something that's going to work in your in your long term. What's another way? Um, what's a, what's another way of actually uh, navigating that you guys may or may not use? Has anyone of you used, used the sun as a means of navigation? I don't want to sound ironic because I know we're in Norway, but um, so there's you know, limited ability to do that to some extent, but um, at least in winter. But um, no, no one? Are you sure? The sun. Right. Is my micro uh, still working? Okay. Um, so, uh, yep, let me see. Right. Right, right, okay. That's another good point. So, yeah, that's obviously something that's, uh, uh, yeah, very feasible in game worlds, right? A bit harder in in real worlds, yes, cool, yeah. Now what I want to get at is, yes, um, perhaps you can observe yourself, if you ever travel to the southern hemisphere and you just, you know, pursue your activity as you would always do, I promise you, <coughs> you will find yourself sometimes walking in the wrong direction. Because even if you don't want, explicitly do it or not, you actually use the sun for your, have a general sentiment where the sun is standing in the afternoon, in the morning, and use that as your mental navigation for east and west orientation. So if you uh, go to the southern hemisphere, you may actually be inverted for some time until you figure that out. And it, you won't really relate it to anything uh, until you realize, oh, hang, hang on, the you know, sun movement is actually quite, uh, quite, quite, uh, quite different down there. So at least for your orientation point of view. Um, cool, we had uh, many of those aspects. So absolute positions, be creative in your games, don't have a uniform representation. You can use uniform elements, but the, the spacing and the positioning should obviously be more structured, right? So it's memorable from a player's perspective. So in Mario World, you can reuse elements in different um, locations and positions, but you need to have that somewhat in contrast to um, um, 
other similar towns. If you model New York twice, for example, it's not particularly helpful for navigation if you need to navigate between those cities, right? Um, <coughs> So one of the claims is that's uh, also what the book states is like that events get far less memorable. So um, the idea is that, and I think Amici's point was quite good, having characters there. If you have, a, for example, I don't know, a fighting uh, situation uh, and you leave a corpse behind, um, then it's probably a much more memorable event in terms of immersion, but also in terms of shaping a landmark for you as a player. So you move back there, right? So. Um, yeah, so that that's uh, one of the other aspects. Oh yeah, since I'm having another example in mind, um, Mount Everest. Does it ring a bell in terms of landmark? Yeah? Anyone? What, in what context? Yeah, more precisely. So that's, 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 that's micro-level perspective. Now micro-level perspective. You're walking up Mount Everest. That's one thing, yep, but so. For example, yep, what else is this? That's bigger, yep. So it's like a meso level, so you see K2 and all the other big uh, uh, mountain ranges lining up, yep. Yeah. Exactly. They use them for navigation. So, you know, if you find the, uh, I don't know what, what they're called, right? The, the, the green Indian, for example, you know, it's an Indian guy that died there on the mountain. They leave them there. I can't recover them. You have a literal valley. It's called Rainbow Valley. And guess why it's called that way? I'm inclined to bring up pictures, but I'm probably not supposed to. I'm supposed to. No, it's a valley full of dead people, and all have different colors because of the stuff they're wearing, right? You know, mountaineering equipment is green, black, blue, pink, whatever. And this whole valley is basically full of people that actually eventually died there and, you know, were left there. And they're not really decomposing because they're drying out, and they're basically mummies, effectively. Uh, so that thing is called Rainbow Valley. But along the way, there's heap of those landmarks, precisely as you pointed out. And they're literally used by the guides, yeah, for navigating, because the landscape can change over you know, uh, the, the, the season and glacier uh, effects and so on. But those are kind of stable components in the entire environment. So a bit macabre, but it's, it, that's, that's as far as the event goes, right? So it has, can have actually meaningful uh, impact there. OK, um, but um, getting from that to something more um, uh, positive as well. So other aspects in terms of navigation or in terms of modeling space is um, that we think about um, Avoiding contradictions. So oftentimes, if we have good intentions, if we de uh, design or engineer, and that's true as game developers as well as application developers, that we tend to over-engineer. So sometimes we don't really pick the simplest solution to a problem, but we're actually overthinking uh, how to make a, um, you know, um, how, to, how to make something convenient. But in fact, we're making it more complicated this way. An example, for example, oh, that's not good. Uh, an example could be to think about paving a particular pathway and forcing people to walk this way and considering it particularly convenient for two reasons, namely, if it's, if it's whatever uh, season, it's unproblematic to walk there because at best you get you know, moderately wet, but if it's like a muddy uh, or swampy area, then it's probably very inconvenient for everyday use. Um, but it's also maintainable and it has this landmark effect, right, that you actually know where you want to walk. But uh, sometimes it also makes life simply harder because um, people tend to find the easiest way to get from two individual points, right? So those desire paths that we famously know, and I think you have seen them before, uh, and I think we talked about this here in, in, in the lecture before. So for in, in seasonal, depending on the seasonal aspect, you may actually use different pathways than you would uh, in, 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 uh, you know, in different uh, seasons. For example, in winter, you probably use the ropes more consistency Sorry, in, no, yeah, in winter you use the roads more consistently than in summer, right? Because in summer you can take a lot of detours and so on, but in winter it's practically infeasible to cross you know, a, a meadow or playground or whatever else because it hasn't been cleared or whatever else, whereas the roads have been, right? Yep, please. Right. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, that's an experience I'm yet to have yet to uh, to make. Um, but yes, yes. But I, I I I get what you mean. Yes. So. But um, depending on you know conditions and so on, that may actually uh, change to some extent. But people are quite good in making the easiest path uh, available from themselves, right? So, um, and there have been considerable, you know, quite some research in some American universities. You know that as well, uh, have been uh, shaped in that way, right? So where they actually didn't make great paths in the first place, but just had people walk there for a year, and whatever they figured out as desirable paths or desirable lines, have been paved fundamentally, right, and became the uh, um, actual official pathway. Um, across Kempa uh, and the like, so that's the idea. Do you know any particular examples from Jovic? That's not Jovic, don't worry. Uh, but do, do you know any example from Jovic? The more interest. I think I found at least, I, I know at least one here, right? This is this uh, small one around the H building, if you walk towards Mustad, that people do take a shortcut through uh, through the grass there, right? So there's kind of, kind of construction going on for this new building, and there's a parking lot, and there's a small uh, desire path actually where people take shortcuts and take off going up the paved way going to the right because it's moderately inclined. Anyway, but that's a classical example of taking those uh, shortcuts you could use. And this is a, a screenshot of um, Virginia Tech, how it looks there from the from top, and you find it's probably the number of uh, desire paths and actually paved paths is kind of on par, uh, so people actually figure out where, where they preferably want to walk or uh, not. So it's one of those examples. So what it means for the game is, uh, or what does it mean for the game? Question to you. What does it mean for the game? Any ideas? No one? Open world games, any ideas there? <coughs> yep. <coughs> yeah, so that's part of it. But for you as a designer, what does it uh, imply as game designer? Well, uh, yep. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. So you're spot on. So you actually need to think about, or well, you as a designer need to think about how can I keep the narrative of the game going, even though the player may potentially have a lot of choice, right? For example, open world games have that characteristic that you actually can take shortcuts, right? So go up the hill instead of following the street, right? So will you miss out of, on, a, uh, on an important event, right? So or perhaps another decision branch that you would need to take. So how can you control that? Some open world games do that by not being really open world, they simply constrain you, right? So you will only be able to walk that proper path and not take any sort of shortcuts, right? So. That's one of those uh, um, um, things that you would need to bear in mind as well. So in how, how, how permissive can you be s without breaking your story, but also how true to the idea of having a, giving a player you know, action space and movement can you, can you afford to be? Yeah. So you're motivating the player to willingly, voluntarily go to that place anyway. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That seems like a very reasonable approach. In fact, yes. I think that's that's pretty much arrow safe, food safe. Yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah. 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 Okay. So was that was that intended? Um, Yeah. Cool. Okay. That's a good. Okay. That's something worthwhile discussing, I guess, uh, in terms of uh, game four and the like. Um, yeah, but those those are certainly aspects you want to consider when um, developing your game. Um, looking at the added, um, elements of um, 
reusability, I mentioned already that probably if you have landmarks, you would you want to use them sparsely, right? If you have a very special buildings, you want to wouldn't want to reuse them repeatedly or copy entire sections of your scenario and reuse them. So uh, instead, the idea of using some sort of established patterns uh, may may also be helpful, even though we may model, in, for example, in a strategy game, particular area that have similar structure, you want to still uh, make them sufficiently um, individual or sufficiently specialized so individuals can actually uh, still perceive them and treat them as different areas, sections, suburbs, and so on. So it's one of the things. Um, looking at the other problem is consistency. Well, when you become individualized and have a more specialized, more customized modeling of different areas, the risk is there. How do you sustain consistency among your, you know, uh, um, your, 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 your art or your um, buildings and so on? Right. So the idea is there. Number one, what is appealing to a potential spectator? Number two, how do you, you know, again manage that consistency? And um, the idea is here to use patterns to follow best practices to some extent, at least as guiding principles, because you wouldn't want to reinvent a house or any structural element of a house uh, from scratch every time you develop a game, right? So you want to have some baseline, because it probably won't be the core of your game anyway, right? It's just an infrastructure element that you use. Um, and you want to use best practices wherever uh, that is possible. And um, obviously, in this case, games need to borrow from disciplines that have that experience or invest the time in optimizing those um, um, you know, patterns, if you like. And architecture is certainly one of them. Um, and that's why you probably should be dealing with this uh, as well. Do you guys know about the golden ratio? Did you hear that? Heard about it? Everyone? Yeah? From where? From this course or elsewhere? You can speak loud and personal interest design. I just want to know because that is highly. Yep, you. Sorry. Junior high. Okay, cool. Yep, everyone. Who didn't? You. Okay, cool. So I don't need to go into that one. So is anyone unclear what it's about? Yes, okay. So the golden ratio is basically the idea that um, um, that you have a... Um, unfortunately, I don't have a... Ah, there's a board. Cool. So the golden ratio board is about uh, the identification of a seemingly irrational ratio between different... Um, different segments. So for example, you have a line and that is unequally... Um, Separated into a subsection that is, for example, uh, called A and B, and this uh, whole line would be considered C. Then the idea is that a um, the golden ratio would exist or would um, um, yeah would basically um, work if the relationship between C and A meaning the relationship between the complete, the entire length of that particular line um, and the longer part, the longer subset of it, corresponds to the relationship between the longer subset of that entire line, A in this example, to B, right? If this ratio is identical, then it's considered the, uh, then it's this, the golden ratio. And that seems, empirically, seems to respond well with us human beings, right? So we seem to have, find it, Faces that maybe in terms of architecture, in nature, and the like, right? So, yeah, please. Ah, okay. I haven't seen that. Okay, that's possible. Yep, cool. So, credit cards, architecture, um, beauty, and human bodies is perceived based on that ratio. Um, in fact, three parts have this characteristics. So, if you look at arms, they have this. Um, this uh, relationship feature as well, obviously not perfectly, but this could be considered a characterization of beauty. Um, so yeah, a Greek concept, but intensely used in architecture. For example, in Paris, you know the Notre Dame Cathedral? Has anyone seen that? It's inherently based on the idea uh, of having uh, the golden uh, ratio in every element of its design, or in most elements of its design. Um, 
but since you have a background in this, I wouldn't uh, want to... Um, I have a small video on this one, which is quite insightful. I'll leave it as a link in here. You can watch it at your own discretion, I guess, because since you all seem to be acquainted, it's a little point digging deeper into this. But um, that would be good for your unit design. If you want to, for example, inject buildings, people, individuals, characters, think about those principles uh, and how far you can actually um, reuse them, right? So, but there's always the risk of overusing it. Another aspect in terms of spaces or the opportunities that you have when using spaces is that um, you don't, beyond um, th those characteristics, you're not bound to what's physically possible, right, in your games. That's quite different. Can you come up with an example of a game that actually defies laws of, you know, physics or uh, uh, realism anyway? So, okay, yeah, so that's more like a, a game design feature, but it's still, uh, even though it defeats the laws of gravity in that particular case, uh, or defies, rather, that's the term, uh, it still kind of harmonizes again with the entire physical environment eventually, right? It's just this very feature, right? But the entire world in itself is still based on physical prince laws, I guess, right? <coughs> um, that's more a question, I'm not sure. Is it the only, is that an exception of... From uh, you know, is that is an exceptional situation in that game, or is it? Do you, did you find it? Is it in multiple places in that game that you have those characteristics? Okay, okay, right. Yes. So that's one. That's a one. One good example. Yes, very nice one. There's some antechamber. Yep. Can you describe the um, unrealism there? So that's a spot on. That's exactly, yep, a good example. Another one, yep. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Right, 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 right. Okay. okay. Right. So you, you are fairly acquainted with the idea, so it's not really um, something magical. So basically you're not bound by the characteristics of physical worlds, but you obviously, need, again, needs to resonate with your game, right? So if it's something totally off, it doesn't make sense, but it can be the gameplay itself, right? So uh, I guess in the anti-chamber example, that highlights quite well that it's part of uh, um, the idea of the game in the first place to deal with those uh, kind of situations, right? Cool. Um, so one thing to bear in mind is um, always, and we mentioned it earlier when talking about landmarks, is about relative positioning. We humans are really not particularly good in thinking about in terms of absolute, uh, um, um, you know, yeah, positions in a wider sense. We always uh, look for relating things to each other in a way, right? So the same with supernatural agency. If we can't explain something, we we oftentimes look for some way of explaining it, even if it's rationally not uh, um, sensible to do that, right? But it's the game in, uh, same in games, so it's not so relevant where you are absolutely positioned in your game world, but relative to other things. That's quite important to uh, be aware about this. And that's why um, the accuracy is usually secondary to the navigability of a, a scenario, right? So if your scenario defies the laws of physics, that's to some extent okay. Uh, because we, as long as we can still navigate it and understand it to some extent. There's considerable research about the human perception of proximity and distance, for example. We tend to have a um, confused, in particular for intermediate distances, a confused perception of distances. For example, if I ask you to gather how far it would be from here to uh, down to Mursa, you mm, would probably mentally underestimate the distance it actually is. Yeah? So even though we have a very clear conception of how far it is and what the landmarks are on the way, we don't really perceive distances between those, but rather the landmarks that are associated with this. Yeah? So it's a very human thing to, to do that. So it's all about relations, not so much about absolute metrics. Yeah. Accuracy is secondary. Again, in games you can exploit that. You can make travel between two distant locations relatively fast and the human user wouldn't even object to it. Yeah? As long as the navigation is clear and uniform. 
that's one of the aspects that um, is uh, discovered there. So um, looking beyond the space that we're interacting with, the other aspect is also um, thinking about the individuals themselves, right? So you need to design uh, uh, individuals. Yep, please. Ah, right, very nice. Right, right. That's a good point. That's a good point, yes. Another, yeah, right. They may actually have another um, uh, dimension of measurement. You're right. So good point, very good point. Yes, instead of the absolute metrics that we apply. Because again, it includes his, himself as a, or herself as a variable, right? So, because depending on the walking speed. Cool. Yeah. Um, so, another thing is about now coming back to consistency. We're talking about space being appropriate for a particular gameplay you're interacting with, but also consistency in terms of um, do different worlds relate, uh, um, you know, from an aesthetic point of view, from a design point of view, but it's equally important for characters. So, if you're designing characters, you want to have a humanoid, perceivable conception of what the size, for example, of a character is, right? So, how, how, how tall is, um, um, well, how, is, how tall is the, uh, in the movie Avatar, right? So, you probably recall that thing, yeah? Does anyone, yes? So, what's the size of the character there, the uh, main protagonist, roughly? That's right. So let's say in the in, in not in the wheelchair. So. But the, the, the yeah. Anyone else? So yeah. Yep. Cool. So yeah, so that's actually, so in fact, yes, for the movie, they had an absolute metric they implied, and I think it's one and a half time human size, roughly. So, you know, so it's actually considerably larger than a human, uh, even though we may not perceive it this way. But the important thing is to do that, if you, firstly, to do that in the first place in your game world, so you need to think about, okay, if I'm a model player, how large is he or she actually? Why is it important? Right, that's that's more like an aesthetic element, right? So where we feel that the humans have the right size, yeah. What are the aspects? <coughs> right. So speed of movement, yeah. That's an important factor. Yeah. What else? Let me see. Ah, okay. <laughs> right, right, right. That's right, that's right. So that's more like a, a context problem, right, in terms of what's your user base, right? But what you could still do in this game was to apply relative measures, right? So you would, for example, know the temperature at which humans apparently die when diving or whatever else, but so you knew that anything higher than that, most likely you will survive in World of War, even though you couldn't relate to the actual metric, right? But it still made sense relatively, right? So um, you retain this element, but it's, it's a very good point. You need to obviously have a metric that people understand, your, you know, your users actually understand, yep. Yep, 
exactly. So relative to the human, yeah, big and small, yep. I agree with this, but uh, and, and here the metric system is not something that's super variable, right? So <laughs> it's like a rather fixed concept you can relate to. But for currency, I think it's a very, you're right, it's a spot on example because it's a dynamic concept, right? So uh, currencies change, especially in the modern times with, you know, um, perhaps uh, blockchain currency being more decisive than the actual currency. So um, no, that's, that's a very good point. Um, Yes, so the relative size is important, and there was a, a comment, the, the idea is really about designing a world appropriately as well, right? Because um, if you want to m model your world, for example, your architecture, right, you c roughly need to have an understanding what the size of a human is, right? Not, not, like, not like that, right? So wouldn't be good if the door handle is up here and I'm rather small in that world, but it needs to correspond to the, inter the action space that you're dealing with, right? If your actor is, should be able to jump through windows or enter or exit through different doors or whatever, he or she needs to be able to actually accomplish that, right? So the world needs to correspond to the size of the actor and the abilities. So if you have an artificially small actor, for example, then he or she will be constrained in the action space, right? Even though that may not be intended. So it's one thing that's super important <laughs> to have a relationship that... Ob so this way you can embed uh, fairness of capabilities. First of all, independent of the chosen uh, character, for example, players are still able to accomplish something or not. And it needs to correspond to the use, space, use cases that you uh, um, apply in your real world. That's probably more, again, it's about relationship. It doesn't really matter how, how absolutely, um, um, what's the absolute size and scale of your actors, but it's important that it corresponds to the world. That seems to be the key uh, challenge there. Yep. Please. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. But No, no, I, I, I agree with you. You can work with this. Um, it really depends how close this world is uh, to your reality, right? So in World of Warcraft, it's still grounded in some sort of physical world that we po kind of possibly relate to, right? Riding animals and all that kind of stuff. Whereas in a space world, it's not something we imminently relate to, especially travel is something very obscure for us, right? So that's why we have science fiction, you know, uh, uh, this body of science fiction work that is just, you know, going in all directions in terms of metrics and so on. So in this case, yes, you, I think I agree, I absolutely agree, you can be as loose as you like, as long as you get your objective done, right? So it's about this, yes, good point, very, very good point. So, cool. So, but again, the, magic, the idea here is really about getting the relative size of the characters right, relative to each other, but also relative to the... Um, the scale to um, you know the environment they're interacting with, without constraining the action space in particular, but also without defying aesthetics. If some individual is uh, unrealistically large or small, the idea here uh, mentioned of putting uh, individual avatars on building or whatever else um, is a good way of actually assessing whether your subjective perception of that um, building, for example, is realistic right, of the scale. So it's another aspect as well. Um, and there's. In, uh, this was is described in the book, the uh, idea um, of dealing with the differentiated perspective between the player and real life perception. So as a uh, person, we're actually quite capable to navigate relatively narrow spaces. Uh, because it comes, becomes reasonably uncomplicated, we need to do it intuitively, especially if we memorize our landmarks. We can, you know, I don't know if you guys have that concept, you want to go uh, to the toilet at night, right? You don't need to switch on your light because you can still navigate even in relatively narrow student flats and you will definitely find your way, right? So, whereas if you control um, a player from a 
third person perspective, like in, you know, in, uh, um, in a game, um, it becomes a lot trickier to actually navigate narrow spaces. I'm not sure if anybody shares that uh, perception. No? So it's a lot harder to navigate around obstacles from a third person's perspective if you're controlling that player than it is if you're in a first person perspective. Yeah? Now it's ah, back again. Good. Um, so that's one of the aspects considered in game design as well. How do you um, skew the perception, the third person perception, yep, uh, in order to, to make that na more navigable? Yep, please. Mm hmm. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I understand what you mean. Yeah. But, um, yeah. So, but but um, I mean, if you if you're navigating sideways and you have multiple obstacles in a way, it's a lot easier to just perceive them directly. But I agree, you won't see the bigger picture, right? So you don't have this. As a third-person player, you kind of have more like a macro-level perspective on the situation, like godlike. You're more objectified, if you like, whereas the individual player will actually see the particular boundaries uh, of of his action space, particularly when uh, dealing thinking about walking right now and navigation. So, like we do this. Um, fine grade adjustments of our walks, which we're actually not really conscious about. But as a player in a third person world, you probably need to do it explicitly. And that's why uh, where the, it can be a bit tricky because it may be hard to figure out if you're actually uh, hitting against that table there or if you're actually uh, well off, well clear of that table, right? So that's that's a lot easier to figure out in a first play person perspective, right? As as opposed to third person perspective, where you're not really sure about this. Um, but the, the idea is just to it's a subject of playtesting, intense playtesting, that you really need to think about, okay, what, there's two components uh, you need to be wary about, one of them being the scale of objects, so one, of, one way of dealing is uh, reduce the scale, perceived scale on third-person perspective, or to space them out, to, uh, to give the um, player g greater freedom actually moving about. On the other hand, if you, s if you spread them out you know, systematically this way, for example, it looks reasonably artificial, right? So that's not how the uh, conventional setup would look like, that is probably much closer to it. So you would also need to consider when you scale up to make um, spaces more navigable to maintain the aesthetics, right? For example, have chairs closer to the, to the table, for example, um, or yeah, or perhaps, you know, um, bring um, components into closer proximity. So that's that's one of the messages about there. It's about playtesting and not always insisting on reality so, or realism, but sometimes you need to Based on your gameplay, similar to the uh, diagonal movement, you need to uh, adjust um, the, the game, the aesthetics a bit to make it more playable or more enjoyable. Especially if it's not the core of your game to navigate around your house, but just to get through, then you wouldn't want to um, uh, burden the player with obstacles in this area. So it's the game. Cool. Um, right. So I think yeah, I'm really running out of time here, so am I. Um, <coughs> but so uh, looking at the aesthetic bit, yeah, please. Let me see. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. 
Very good point. Very good point. No, that's a very good uh, um, idea, a very good thought there. Yeah, if you're designing from different perspectives. So, um, yeah, cool. So, um, looking at the aesthetic bit, um, the ideas there are really, you know, again, having a considerable experience um, probably help you to define or make a game more aesthetic. But also, looking, I was earlier talking about um, um, you know, transmedia worlds or long, <coughs> long-lasting games. Uh, then it's quite important to actually be consistent over give different game titles, right? So you need to have a um, art that is well developed over the different iterations, or only experiences minor adjustments to still be in consistent with the original story, right? So Star Wars, for example, you can introduce some changes, but it can't be too drastic. You, know? you can introduce new characters, but they still need to be co still consistent in terms of. You know, uh, use of technology, uh, clothing, and you know, um, um, behavior to some extent, and or you know, languages used and so on. So, um, th and this is a bit more the artistic element, I guess, of uh, game development that we need to bear in mind. I think you still recall this uh, reference here to those uh, Gestalt psychological um, perspectives on perception, right? So, you guys recall that? Did it in? I think Avon talked about it in lecture two about this. What, what are we supposed to see on the left side? Again, anyone? Yep. Yep, anyone else? Yeah, I guess. Does anyone else see, well, does anyone see something different there? A uh, Dalmatian, sorry, yep. A Dalmatian, a dog. Yep. Ah, cool. Okay, yep. Nice perception. Yeah, cool. You see that here? Yep. Atomic mushroom, yep. Anyone else? Yep. Do you thought it's a tree? Yeah, well, that fits, that fits the conception uh, dimension a bit better, yeah? Anyone else? Any other creative uh, contributions? Yep. You see a dog, yes. Dimension, right? So that one here, I assume. Or another one. I think it's the one. Any, anything else? No? Yes, perhaps? <coughs> well? But on the right side, what do we see there? Do we see anything actually? Yep. Okay, can you outline the features a bit? This one? This bit here? Something, okay. Other interpretation? So again? <laughs> Admittedly, I, I take it, but you know, that's the point. It's very subjective. Um, yep. Anyone? Yep. Cool. Uh, up there. Sorry? Ah, okay. Interesting. Mm. Okay. You see dog again. Okay. Th this one, yeah? Okay. There's a dog. Interesting. Well, there's different angles on it. Um, personally, I'll probably go for the skull as well. But again, that's... That's the point in, in, your, in, your, in your game design again, obviously here very abstract. How do you design something so it's unambiguous for the player, right? So it bec because in the end, there's to some extent reflection of your imagination, but also background or environment, you know, you mix it all together. Uh, or, you know, simply the creativity you just want to engage in. Because you can make yourself see other things that they're actually there. Right? Yep. Right. Very good. Mm. Cool. Right. Okay. Cool. Sounds good. Yeah. So um, to to yeah to uh, 
wrap that up a bit or to, to get a, f a bit more st structured perspective on it, the different types of arts you will be dealing with, right? So as a, as a game designer, it depends on your perspective, whether you're more on the tech side of things or whether you're more on the design side of things, obviously it makes a huge difference and generally it's differentiated between the um, uh, concept art, which basically is more used for, yeah, when would you use concept art? Probably you guys will know better anyway. When would you use concept art, anyone? Yeah, for what reason? Yeah, okay. So you have, you have a second, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, you were some, somewhere here before we go to Amisi. <laughs> that, so that's my marketing side of things, right? Yes. Yes, uh, and I agree with you because uh, when I started playing games, oh, that was ages ago, uh, in, in yeah, somewhere, I was always looking at the outside of games. They were so amazing. But if you tr play those 90s or 80s pixel games, you really get like, what the heck happened here? You know? So uh, it really tricked me by the packaging. Um, so the concept art was usually a striking feature. I agree. So that's definitely part of it. Anyone else? Let me see. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. uh. Right. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's one possible use. He, there was the, the comment here, which I think is uh, quite, quite important. It actually sets up the theme of the entire game, right? So it, it gives you an image. It starts your imagination about the entire world that sits behind it. Right now, we just see that player here on this interaction. But it, it gives you much more better understanding, okay, what the environment possibly about, what the lighting will be, what, you know, uh, what, what the whole th theme would be, including music as well. So my, my holistic perspective that you can extrapolate from that particular instance of art, right? So from a design point of view, it's really helpful to design the entire big theme based on those little instances of very high quality uh, uh, imagination, if you want. Yeah? So that, that's a part of the purpose there. And it's really like er early stage marketing, obviously, is an uh, important thing, but also as a form of brainstorming, right? So you put it out there and you can have a different art and you can actually contrast and think, okay, what kind of worlds can I build based on this? Yeah, so that's that's uh, part of the idea there. Whereas once you move a bit um, further ahead in the game development, the idea is then, well, obviously, since you don't actually implement those guys anyway, you start with placeholders, right? The placeholders are more like a, um, from a technical perspective, so that it's really about having the accurate size, so you want to actually get the metrics right, uh, and basically have a very simple, low fidelity, um, you know, uh, entity that acts in place of whatever the final thing will be, right? So you just have a player, simple avatar moving around, but it's not really featureful, not detailed, but the important thing, all the characteristics need to be accurate, including size, including action capabilities. Those should be implemented, right? So just the design aspect is then secondary because you would be able to um, have um, different textures anyway to make this uh, game as diverse or seemingly diverse as possible. Um, and then obviously in the, for the implementation, the challenging thing is there, first of all, get a good, um, yeah, aesthetic, aesthetically pleasing representation of a player, but it also needs to work within the technical constraints, you know. You recall, aesthetics are usually constrained by technology, right? So as the earlier example, if you have the, uh, the games and the games is inherently pixelized and there's nothing like that we would remotely call rendering in there, um, then it's simply bounded by the technical incapabilities that is 
You know? Secondly, you also need to think about, hang on, different, you know, different machines will have different uh, configurations, therefore I need to support different de levels of detail resolution. Problem is you need to model all of them, right? So you really need to think about how does it look in you know, highest resolution, moderate and low resolution. You can't just concentrate on one of them. So it not only increases your workload, but also requires you to think about, you know, how can I, um, the trade-off between performance eventually and the level of detail. How can I model a figure that is <coughs> pleasing, but still, um, you know, useful as a player, as an avatar in the game. So that's um, a bit more looking at the bigger picture. The first one is really like, what's the world about the narrative you want to develop? The second one is, how do I develop the mechanics and use a placeholder to do that? The third one, bringing everything together and looking at the technological constraints that are uh, playing against the aesthetics. Yeah? So those are the kind of uh, aspects that one is dealing with. So, um, yes, and that's pretty much it. I mean, yeah, as far as I gather here, so I must admit I'm not a designer myself, so um, the, the idea is really there to, um, yeah, learn it by doing. So that's the intuition. So getting into it and uh, taking inspiration by others, but again, bear the, bear the, um, constraints in mind or bear patterns in mind that have existed. We talked about the um, golden ratio as one aspect of it, um, but also then uh, realistic metrics where possible or feasible or realistic. But more important than the realistic metrics is the realistic relationship between different, you know, uh, world and player, character to character, world to world, if you have multiple worlds. Less you have the intent. Is it as opposed to a normal sized character and so on, unless it's intent. But this is something that's quite important to uh, bear in mind. The rest is like, you know, you do it, you get better at it, hopefully, or, you know, not, or if you're not getting better at it, delegate it to someone else. I think that's the usual uh, approach that people would do, I suspect. And um, yes, looking at the technical aspects, again, scale, lighting, and this links it back to concept art. How can I re recreate the scene or imagination that has been presented here? It may also go as far if you have teasers, for example. You still need to align the game with those ones, um, especially if they have been pre-produced uh, prior to actually finalizing the game. How can you get the same atmosphere uh, that this game produces? And the idea is here that you really are able to recreate the world hopefully to an extent that it's kind of can spawn over into real life, like merchandise, you know, secondary games, uh, um, um, you know, spawning off of it, you know. So, um, and for this, you need to kind of have an aesthetic place that is, or a world that is, is it's pleasing enough for you to want to re-immerse into it, right? Like you, I don't know, the, the, the constant re 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 reinvention of, um, you guys know about the, Super Nintendo consoles, right? That are the classic consoles that are currently on the market here and there for like you know limited um, limited editions of so on of the old games. And it's really about people that want to rediscover games they previously played because they want to experience those worlds again. So in this case, it's quite can be quite easy to hook back into that and build you know additional opportunities from a, from a, a market point of view. Um, if you create an aesthetically pleasing world that people want to stay in and be in, movies the best example. Uh, like the whole Disney empire is built on this idea, um, Star Wars again, you know, and, but it can also happen obviously uh, for games as a spin-off or the movie as a spin-off of a game ultimately, right? Blade Runner was one example for that one, for the iteration between those. Cool, um, that's it from my side. Um, so we learned something, or we talked about spaces, I'm not sure if I got Probably just call them. I oh, am yeah, ready. Okay. Uh, it's from the um, World Summit, and he will call me now. So let's see if we get that connected to um, this environment here. Ah, oh, yeah. Uh, mobile Web Summit. So you see my screen. That's good. There he is. So, I don't hear you yet.
Yeah, we see you. So that's the exactly as an example for low fidelity, right? So it doesn't really work. So I probably need to interact with him and ask him. Uh, that's a very flaky internet there, though, isn't it? Yeah, I think that they mentioned already have a considerable internet constraints there. Well, it's a bit ad, ad hoc exercise here, so I'm not, uh, yep. Yeah, I'm not sure if he's actually still there in the meantime. Um, yeah, all right, there you go. There's some movement happening. So they're currently uh, in, in uh, Lisbon, want to share their experience and perhaps give some exposure to a um, the rather uh, large um, Congress that's happening there multiple thousand participants and they're presenting something, some work they did here um, as part of some, some uh, European project. Um, and the idea was basically that they share a bit of an impression of what's happening there, right? Get, get a feel of the environment, yeah. low fidelity concept art, and we don't hear anything. <laughs> but we see something. Ah, <laughs> nice, beautiful. So, yep. Yeah. That was not a good idea. Ah, there you go. I, I can just try if I really, s it's my sound card, but I'd, frankly, I doubt it. I think it will be all output devices. So we saw some pictures. Um, so that was basically the essence of it. Uh, perhaps it comes back in a few seconds with less latency, but there you go. It's a pity so that we can't hear them. It would be really good to get some uh, practical insight of what's happening there. Um, looks more like an airport, doesn't it? Airport hangar. So, yeah. Oh well. So they, yeah, I don't know. I could point him to the stream URL so he can watch us and then he can respond via the chat and then we can, uh, probably not. Um, ah well, so do I get anything? I can update soon on the conference. I'm making connections which might be useful in Google Game. Yeah, okay, that's more like a um, talk. But, um, so yeah, he just suggests he's currently there, and particularly if you have a long-term perspective in making games or dealing with gamification. So there it's really more, not sp specifically about games, the Mobile uh, World Congress, I believe. And it's pretty much about gamifying uh, you know, um, uh, particular problems, particular for crime detection and things like that. Or, um, um, so that's what, what they're actually operating in. And they may, he's basically uh, visiting quite a number of different organizations in that respect that are, have stalls there. So, yeah, so, okay, I'll just read to you what they, can you read it? Possibly, right? Oh, you can read it, so I don't need to read it to you. So it would be my take on what he's saying anyway. So, um, but they are basically, yeah, just trying to make connections and hoping that you guys can benefit from it, especially in your advanced years, if you're uh, doing, you think about your bachelor of GAVE, um, things like that. And obviously, yeah, making money out of it. So, now to make it more realistic, I'm actually giving him exposure to you. Uh, uh. So, <coughs> he suggests a very odd way to lecture. I believe it is. Huh? Texting. Yeah, texting lecture, right? 
How effective would that be? Would be interesting as well, right? Isn't it? Instant messaging. Next time we meet on Discord. Um, oh. Okay, cool. Yeah, leave it at this. So he suggests he will do something and uh, you know stream something and post it on Blackboard so you can watch it um, um, asynchronously. It's probably easier. That makes more sense. Yep. Cool, yeah, take you around the conference a bit, give an impression, okay. We can try. Really, are we doing Skype? Okay, let's see. I'm not sure if I'm on Skype with him though. Skype is a bit of a thing of the past, I guess. You'll probably be there as Simon McCallum. Oh, there I do, actually. Hello. I hear you, but the student don't. The students don't yet. Give me a second. I just need to relay you to the um, um, get the right point. Audio settings. Come on, speakers. I want you to be no. Now they should hear you. Cool, they should hear you now. Do you hear me by any chance? Okay, you can hear me. Okay, that's good. Um, that's, that's a lot better than, than Discord was doing then. Um, so, you know, as I said, I've been, been talking to various people um, and we've um, and been looking at... at uh, both the sort of game design stuff we've been teaching you, which was um, with a, a company who is, is yep. selling games to businesses um, uh, and changing businesses to be more responsive to their um, their employees, right? So treating their employees like you would players and trying to measure whether they're getting into flow and, and, and how engaged they are in their activities. Um, we've also been looking at a lot of the app development companies that are here. So uh, I think that's that's been been interesting. Um, there is uh, also groups here who are trying to do that marrying between um, you guys as future developers and employers because there are so many employers who need developers and need good quality developers that the market on on marrying up the um, the talent and they call you guys talent um, with companies is. Because what some of these startups are doing is they're saying, well, companies are coming in and the one I was just talking to was saying that they take computer science graduates and they give them, um, and they actually did, you know, web programming skills, data analytics, uh, and mobile skills, because most universities don't teach those three things. They don't teach information security, they don't teach mobile development, and, and they don't teach um, web development, particularly cloud stuff. Um, and so what they were doing is they were saying, well, companies are coming in demanding these skills. So what they've set up is basically an academy to teach the skills that businesses are currently wanting. And then, and this is a strange model. They make you pay 5,000 US dollars for this. So um, 50,000 for an hour. If you get a job, they give you your money back. So it's a, a an odd incentive model where you know you pay an upfront, and if you can't get a job, you've just got a massive debt. So it puts real pressure on people to get a job after the end of their this this process. Um, but that's because their business model is getting companies to pay them as recruiters. 
and so they need you to get a job so that they can get money from the company which is why they put the pressure on you as a as a student or a developer um, and in terms of, of um, what we teach so um, this is also a place where we come and discuss with businesses and startups what they learned what they needed to know what they didn't know how we can change our course to make it easier for people to get into business and get into companies um, so we've got you know Mercedes and, and um, Atlassian and, and IBM and, and all of those big companies are here. Um, cool. Oh, you're typing something? Do you hear me? Yes. Um, so, so one of the things we're, we're doing is we're, we're, we're teaching a lot. So, so we're making sure that what we're offering you guys is relevant and interesting and appropriate uh, and at the right level. So, um, so yeah, so um, if we can if we can make our courses better by finding out what companies are actually doing and needing, uh, that's how we, we design our curriculum. So that's part of the reason I'm here. I'm also here because I'm part of a European project. Um, and so I'm, we, I was supposed to have a booth here and be presenting our gamification of community policing, um, which is our research. One of the research activities we have is looking at how we can bring games to engage the population in other activities. So this, this example, it's about understanding the role of the police by playing a game uh, and uh, particularly looking at, at children engaging uh, so we were we were looking at doing that with the with the Portuguese police um, but unfortunately some of those negotiations fell through so now here I'm trying to collect data that I can use to help improve the curriculum that we give you guys um, now it's this is a 60,000 person event right so there are 60,000 people attending um, and, it's a, and so there are five massive pavilions, uh, each of them packed with people. Um, so it is it is a, a massive event here. Um, we are, yeah, we are we are kind of meeting people and talking constantly. So I'll I'll probably be hoarse by the end of the three days. Um, but the the goal is to make those connections and also look at the international market and, and really for you, for you as developers we need to show you and make sure that our courses are going to make you the best possible fit to be employed in this market. So I thought I'd just say hello and say um, that, that that's why I'm here and hopefully um, Christopher is able to talk about spaces and environments a bit um, and, and give you an insight into some of that. Some of you are in the process of, of having just submitted your games, building your games. Um, so uh, building some of those spaces will be interesting so hopefully that will be relevant um we'll have nadia and um miriam lecturing next week so nadia will be talking about her expertise in character and environment design over the next few weeks and miriam will be talking about user-centered design and universal design and her expertise as a as a as a designer um so we have we have a very design feel for the next two weeks in this course. Um, uh, unfortunately, I won't be there in either of those days, So, but I'm, I'm replacing myself with hopefully people that you'll find very engaging. Um, so um, good luck. And um, you may have noticed we've been going, getting some grading done, but I was halfway through the grading when my internet cut out last night. So unfortunately, I didn't get all the stuff done that I needed to. So uh, I'll try and do finish that off tonight for those who are wondering about the grades about the second assignment. Okay, so uh, Christopher, do you have any questions? Today? Okay, I can briefly show the area. Quick. Um, yep, I can. I can go for a walk. I'll just grab my bag, and I will. So, do you guys have questions I should relate? Up here. So, so yeah. So this is. So, sorry. Are you so you have. I want to come to lunch. You can yes, I, mean, I, I know about this. I will play that later on this week. Yeah. Here, thank, thanks. So. Yeah. So, yeah. What you guys can see just there. Are startup booths. So those are people who have, have come. Uh, and as you see, my videos. Um, and and I'll, I'll take you to Beacon Force. See, 
this is. Oh, I shouldn't have suggested him walking around. Right. This is the. Thanks for coming. So. Cool. So. So. So this is this is Deacon Force. Um, so you can see Deacon Force. So if you have a look down here, and like point you at the right place, you can see that they have um, the flow chart. And the idea is that by asking them the right bits, you can understand what your business is doing. Right? So, um, so this is so. Hi. Um, I'm say hello to my class in Norway. The class in Norway. Yes. Yeah, so this is this is my my class. Right? That's that's the other lecture. But I'm I'm so, well. He gave my lecture today, and so live streaming. Yeah, live streaming to Norway to say hello to my game design class. So game design class. So yeah. So so it's my first year game design class. So this is the CEO of the company. Very well. Gamifying business intelligence and kind of understanding yeah, 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 your, yeah. your employees. Yeah. The managers usually suck. Yeah, yeah. Have, right? yeah. So, so, yeah, hope you enjoy the class, guys. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is game, like game design turned into another purpose of looking at it yeah. from, from other perspective. So, I don't yeah. Michael is a game designer, so yeah. maybe he's told you, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was going to say hi to him when I came back, but yeah, he's yeah. sort of like the outer of board games. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So, as you see, when we made you do board games, the guy who founded this company also did board games as his profession. That's the second assignment for these guys for their class. They have to make board games. That's so, actually the smart game of the best games. Yes. Oh, yeah, because partly because you have to define the rule set so humans can understand it. You have to be very clear about how you think about your rules. You can't just make them more and more complex. Yeah. And in the end, it so, turns out that it works. So this, this was best. Yeah. And it worked. So, okay, well, I'll say goodbye for now. And uh, so, 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 uh, okay. Bye, everyone. Enjoy. I guess. Yeah. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Cool. Right. So, so that was interesting. <laughs> Not sure what that was, but... Um, so. It was, uh, no, but yeah, so they're actually kind of there, so it seems to be quite busy, and they'll try to forge contacts as far as you've got that for you guys, because uh, it seems like uh, the teaching that's done here appears to be more realistic, more relevant to the industry than m much of the theoretical teaching, right, on, on other areas, because it's really m mixing mobile technologies, games, and largely security, which seems to be a topic there uh, in particular, and they are, have been working in one of those projects and basically introducing them there and forging yeah, different opportunities. So once you guys get closer to your bachelor of Gav, it's probably worthwhile talking again about this and uh, reminding him of it. But I suspect he will not, uh, 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 you know, um, he will use any opportunity he can talk about this experience in class anyway. So if he happens to show up in one of the next classes, he'll probably uh, share uh, quite a bit about it. Um, he also mentioned that next week and the week after that is really dedicated to design and uh, Natya will be talking to you guys um, because she is uh, you know, an actual designer, game designer and she has considerable experience so she probably um, g g provides you a good um, um, introduction to that area to some extent. Cool. Um, questions? Further questions? I heard about the submission issue with the assignment so I'll uh, relay that to Simon but are there other Questions regarding lecture, regarding uh, World Congress, regarding anything else? Okay, well, then I leave you to that. So, uh, this stream is generally only one and a half hours long here, right? This is a spill one, right? So, whereas the application one is uh, not happening today, it seems. So, it's held by Miriam. Miriam, big no and uh, But uh, it, it's probably scheduled at some other time, I guess. But for us, that's pretty much it now, unless you have any questions. Oh, yes, perhaps. Okay. Well, yeah. Well, thanks for making it. So. <laughs>